Hi, I'm Judy Taibji. Thanks for joining us today. I hope you had a great weekend. Many of you, of course, putting up Christmas lights, as Hudson told us. Now, last week we had a lot of heavy topics, and today we're trying to make a segue into some lighter topics. I'm not sure if today's topic falls under that heading, but I should let you know it's under the heading of the environment. As you know, we've looked at El Nino in the past. We've talked about air pollution and logging in watersheds. Today we're looking at global warming, and one of the reasons we're looking at that is because Today in Kyoto, in Japan, an international conference begins. This is expected to be about 10 days of discussion on what to do with greenhouse gas emissions. And what's interesting is over the last few months since we first started looking at climate change issues, um, at one point it seemed to be a debate about whether or not global warming was occurring. And that seemed to be where the debate was, was uh, focused. What I've noticed, certainly in doing the research for today's show, is debate about whether or not global warming is happening seems to almost have been pushed aside. And now the debate is, uh, why is the planet appearing to become warmer? Anyway, we put together this background story, and let's take a look. Global warming is a hot topic for debate. But as our political leaders argue over whether or not climate change is real, an international panel of scientists has been working on a model for change. A conference to finalize an action plan to deal with global warming begins today in Kyoto, Japan, and follows many preliminary discussions over the past few years. The last major scientific discussion in Germany coincided with the Greenpeace protest in the Bering Glacier, which runs from the Yukon into Alaska, and although the glacier still covers about 320 square kilometers, it is reduced in size by over 80 square kilometers in the last hundred years. Greenpeace says the glacier is melting quickly because of global warming and the use of fossil fuels like oil, coal and gas. It may be that today we're seeing an interesting juncture between natural process and human activity. And what we are experiencing is a rapid warming. In addition to concerns over the melting ice are concerns about the impact of the extra water in our oceans. Sea level rise, caused in part by melting glaciers, will flood coastal cities all around the world and threaten low-lying areas like Bangladesh, Pacific Islands, and the Gulf Coast of the United States. Concern about climate change is in many mainstream media publications. The Vancouver Sun has documented climate change and disease outbreaks. Time magazine released an examination of the planet. And Canadian Geographic's current issue has presented temperature rising, which is an analysis of a large part of western and northern Canada and which outlines some alarming developments. A report released called the Mackenzie Basin Impact Study looks at this region of over 1.8 million square kilometers and concludes that climate change was occurring in this area and was causing melting permafrost, landslides, forest fires, droughts and floods. And although the Mackenzie Basin Impact Study looked at an interior hotspot, Many scientists on the coast acknowledge that the waters here are warmer than expected, and this will end up affecting us economically as well as environmentally. As the climate changes, so does the, sort of the coastal marine ecosystems and the species that live in them. So if the climate continues to change in a very anomalous way, we can expect those changes to affect the ecosystems and, and the commercial fish species that live within those ecosystems. So I guess we have to ask, do you think that climate change is occurring and do you think the government is doing the right thing? Today they've made an announcement. We'll share that with you after a quick break and we'll be taking your calls to this number. Every week. Want to take a peek? A 25-inch Daiwu stereo TV is $40 off, you see. And only at Eaton's, strike up the band. There's a 27-inch Panasonic TV and stand. Put this sharp view cam under your tree. And a forehead VCR is yours for free. Plus, this will make you feel fine. You don't pay till $19.99. And there's me, Mr. Magical Moose. <laughs> only $9.93. Are you brushing twice a day? You could be ruining your hair. It's true. A simple act of brushing can strip away vital protein, even cause your hair to break. The solution? Pantene Pro-V Shampoo and Conditioner. To help keep your hair strong, Pantene's Pro-Vitamins penetrate the root, while the conditioning formula helps improve the entire length of your hair. To help keep it healthy looking, shiny and strong. So it breaks less. Pantene Pro-V. 
for hair so healthy looking, it shines. Don't forget to brush. I'm Chris Holm, and this is Amelia. I don't think anybody is ever really prepared to be a father. My wife and I, we share all the responsibilities. My job's the laundry. Amelia generates a lot of tough stains. Obviously, I had to find some help. So I looked on the internet and found stuff that all parents need to know. Tied with bleach gets out most tough stains Amelia gets into better than the leading detergent. And it helps keep colors bright. It helps when you know what you're doing. If it's got to be clean, it's got to be tied. You have to learn fast to survive. Fidalgo's is your accessory and home decorating store for all seasons. And now, with the holidays just around the corner, Fidalgo's has the most spectacular selection of decor and accent pieces for every room in your home, for yourself or for a gift. And whatever the season, you'll find that perfect item at Fidalgo's. Fidalgo's very distinctive accents. Fidalgo's in Coquitlam in the Sunwood Square on the Lougheed Highway, in Peninsula Village on 24th Avenue in White Rock, and in Park Royal South, West Vancouver. And where do you stand on the global warming issue? Do you think climate change is occurring? Do you agree with those scientists who say it's occurring very rapidly? And of course, the International Conference is underway today in Kyoto, and we'll have to see what our government leaders, what our fearless leaders, have to say about global warming. We have two guests with us today. Some of you will remember Dr. Andrew Weaver was with us talking about El Nino. He's a scientist, and he's from the University of Victoria. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Now, what's the technical title? My technical yeah. title? Oh, just I'm a professor in the university there. Okay, there you go. And <laughs> Bruce Story is with the Skies Above Foundation, and you joined us a long time ago to talk about the ozone hole. Your very first program, Judy. It's a thrill Is to it? be back. Oh, gosh, how time flies. Anyway, and uh, so we'll be taking your calls a little bit early, and then we have a fairly lengthy uh, information package that I want to share with you on a number of issues. I'm going to start with you, Andrew. Um, in your case, obviously, you deal with the earth and ocean sciences all the time. What do you think is going on with the planet? <coughs> I think if you look at the evidence of what's occurred over the last century, uh, there's very clearly a, a small half degree change uh, in the global mean temperature. Now, when you say half degree change in the global mean temperature, that's exactly what it is. It doesn't mean uh, half, it means average over the globe, one half degree. Now, that sounds like a little bit, right. <clears throat> but it's actually, and it, it's actually a lot. And why, why it's a lot <clears throat> is because. It's, in some regions, it's larger. In some regions, it, it's smaller. It could be all so constant. Yeah, and so you, uh, you average this out over the globe, and it, it appears a lot. The question, though, is that the, the hot question is whether or not this 0.6 degrees or 0.5 degrees over the last century is really a signal of anthropogenic, which is human-made uh, global warming. And the, until recently, 1995, there was really a hot debate because of the problem with natural climate variability. Right. And in 1995, a group of scientists involved in the United Nations panel Finally, a reported evidence that showed that climate warming is now detectable as a human influence. And so okay. that was a significant finding. But there's still some debate about those findings. What I find interesting is how this debate has evolved. First, it was a debate, yes, there's global warming. No, there isn't. Okay, now that debate's passed. <clears throat> no, that debate's, it, it, the debate still is still there. The problem is, is you've got to ask who's doing the debate. The debate amongst the scientists, the large majority of the scientists, is not so much is global warming here. It's what what's will, causing what, it? No, not even oh. what's causing it. We know it. What it will be the rate of change in the future and what are the, the, the consequences, the climatic consequences of global warming. So you think that most scientists will agree that human, human activity is causing it? Right. The, the, okay. Where the debate comes, if I could just say, yeah. is, is from a, a few um, uh, fringe elements. And these fringe elements are, have a, are, are by and large supported by the oil and gas and coal industry. And they, ha they, and they have a, a, a self-interest in trying to, to to keep a debate going in, okay. in this issue. I'm going to bring Bruce on. Now, Bruce, you're an environmentalist, I guess, first and foremost. You're a lawyer in your other life. But um, with the Skies Above Foundation, I mean, you've been talking about this stuff for years. Uh, do you feel like we've made some progress? And, and what do you think about the conference in Kyoto? Well, by we, the countries of the world have done some, some interesting steps. Some countries like Britain and Germany and the Netherlands and the Scandinavian countries and Spain, surprisingly, have taken real leadership roles in complying with their commitments under the climate convention, which everyone agreed to. Commitments to roll back greenhouse gas emissions? Or? Well, there are really two commitments under the climate convention. One is to roll back emissions, which is the dirty pollution that has all sorts of other negative effects that we tend not to talk much about. It's not just CO2, but it's all sorts of acidic compounds that destroy our forests and destroy our lakes and water bodies. Right. But the other commitments are to protect, preserve, conserve, and enhance the forests. Because it's actually the forests and the plankton in the ocean that absorb carbon dioxide out of the system. So the filters. That's right. We emit it, and when you look at a tree, all of the carbon in the tree came out of CO2, the tree absorbed from the air. Right. So 
Some countries like Spain have dramatic programs to reforest Spain. Spain basically was a forested country that was deforested in the thousand years or so ago, and now they're planning on reforesting it. Whereas in Canada, for example, there are no national plans to protect, conserve, and enhance the forest. In fact, the Canadian and provincial governments seem intent on destroying the forest as quickly as possible. Okay, so now we're going to get into a big forestry debate. I, don't, I want to look, focus more on climate change, but if you want to take exception to that comment, you certainly can. We'll go to the phones, take a couple calls, and then give a little bit more background on climate change. But we'll start with Chris in Campbell River. Hi, Chris. Hi. Hi, go ahead. How are you? Fine, thanks. Go ahead. Great. Um, I'm, I'm calling about the, uh, on the national, I was watching the other night. Right. In Antarctica, there are beaches that used to be snow, snow covered and now it's just rocks. Right. And, um, and, and great, huge pieces of, uh, of, uh, salt. I mean, ice are breaking off and falling into the ocean right. and I, j I just cannot believe how how stupid these countries are that are keeping on allowing the uh carbon fuels and all right. I, I mean the ozone has something to do with it but not all of it it's I believe it is mostly due to um, the burning of carbon fuels. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. And now, he's mentioning something that we see from time to time on the news, and that's that there appears to be a melting of the ice caps. And any comments on that? Sure, uh, that's uh, a good question that's raised. The, the thing about the Antarctic is that Antarctic is, is, and the ice there is really influenced by a local climate. Uh, what I mean by that is, Small changes in local temperature cause effects there. <clears throat> now, what what the phone was phone caller was referring to was recent observation of, of retreating of some of the sea ice that exists there. Now, that's there has been an observed warming in Antarctica over the last few decades, and and that probably is the cause of of the the re retreating of the sea ice. Now, the sea ice doesn't affect. Um, sea level because sea ice is floating and so is already displacing its same mass. Except if it's sitting on top of if the land. If it's sitting on the land then it displaces, uh, okay. but it's not clear that, uh, okay. that this is a response to global warming. Bruce wants, desperately wants to I come. I desperately want to talk about this because <laughs> one thing we don't hear about when we hear about sea level rise, that's mostly talking about thermal expansion because the oceans are a bit warmer, they expand and they occupy a bit more space. The caller makes an excellent point about stability issues pertaining to Antarctica. Antarctica has two giant ice sheets, the <coughs> east and the west ice sheet. And right now, the west ice sheet is two-thirds collapsed. It's, it's not what it was 5,000 years ago. It's now, was that a floating collapsed. sheet, or was that on top of land? It's floating. It's you're both, saying? actually. Both? Okay. And there are a large rain of mountains, uh, in range of mountains in between the two sheets. So some scientists, the official government of uh, Britain and U.S. scientists studying Antarctic ice sheet stability, predict that it's not very stable at all and that okay. the warming and the melting of the, the sheets mm -hmm. around the edge could cause the, the shelves to collapse. Okay, let's take another call. Let's talk to Steve in Fanning Bay. Hi, Steve. Hi. Hi, go ahead. Um, having studied climatology a little bit and having been to the Arctic and the Antarctic... And You've been? Oh, you bet. Oh, nice. Uh, and uh, this is what concerns me, Judy, is we have a lot of uh, people talking in absolutes. And, and if you were up in the Arctic, Judy, uh, you would find that there are actually uh, fossils sitting right on the surface of a, mm -hmm. of a forested area that was up there, uh, almost tropical, semi-tropical. Mm -hmm. And we would find that at one time the, the Canadian continent was all awash underwater. Right. We would find that we were at one time all under ice. Right. Um, <laughs> my question to these guys is, where is the definition drawn? I mean, how much effect are we having? Surely the world has uh, climactic cycles mm -hmm. that, are, that are greater and uh, longer than even the span of mankind itself. So I kind of feel like we're talking in a completely gray area and trying to turn it into a black and white area okay. where that doesn't belong in the, you know, you know okay. what I'm saying? Yeah, I do, and I think that's oh, a I'd very love to important. Address, okay, okay. A super question. You get to go first and then well, <laughs> why, why is the, the difference between what, the, what the, the, the phone caller is pointing out between now and the past is, is the relative stability of the climate. If you look okay, at the Okay, so hold on a little bit. We're all acknowledging that right. the world's weather patterns go through these cycles. Right. Okay. Ice so ages, non-ice ages, right. volcanic events. And, and, and so you're saying there's difference between what we're having now right. and Right. Over, oh, the, over the last 10, if you look in the Earth's history, as, as long as you look back and you ask the question, can I find a period of climate stability? What I mean by that is period where it's relatively stable. You know, a few swings here and there, big deal. But 
can you find that? And the answer is no. The last 10,000 years have been, uh, are, have been stable. Uh, that is, there's been very little rapid change. It's been relatively mild. And this, this is unparalleled. The difference between, again, what the phone caller was, was pointing out, natural uh, things like ice ages and uh, going from one to the other, versus what we're doing is the rate of change, is that the emissions, the anthropogenic emissions, are human caused. Human, yeah. Okay. They're, they're, they're changing the CO2 levels much more rapidly than has happened in the past. And this is the concern, the rate of climate change, okay. as opposed to just the, the natural cycle. I know you want to answer. What I, we really need to show an information package, and then we'll get back to the phones, and you can answer the next sure. one. Sure. Okay, so now this is going to take a little while. We have to work through this because there's a lot of different aspects to this whole climate mm -hmm. change thing. And unexpected changes in elements of our climate are creating havoc with our physical and biological environment. In the summer of 1997, ocean scientists recorded a significant increase in West Coast waters. And at the same time, the Provincial Public Health Department noted a dramatic increase in red tides and shellfish contamination. This mimics outbreaks of waterborne disease on the <coughs> East Coast. One example led to the death of over one billion fish in U.S. waters alone since 1991. Possible weather-related outbreaks include cholera, malaria, and I wrote that wrong, it's supposed to be cryptosporidium. In British Columbia, there were 240 boil water advisories in effect for communities in November. Insurance companies have felt the pinch of weather-related claims over the past few years. In 1966, there were approximately $500 million in claims, which rose to a staggering $11 billion in 1996. And the previous information is from Stephen Hume of the Vancouver Sun. And discussed in Canadian Geographic, a six-year study called the Mackenzie Basin Impact Study brought together forest ecologists, permafrost uh, geologists, wildlife biologists, scientists, and the observations of residents within this area. This region is a useful indicator of the potential impact of climate change as it has a diverse geography, which includes glaciers, mountains, barley fields, past pastures, freshwater deltas, boreal forest, wetlands, peatlands, and tundra. So quite a diversity. Over the last 35 years, each of these ecosystems has undergone notable change. The increase in temperature has been one degree per decade. In this study, the southern edge of the permafrost was shown to have retreated north by about 100 kilometers. There has also been glacial retreat, landslides, and low water levels. The melting permafrost has increased the ferocity of forest fires because less moisture is present in the soil when the fires occur. According to Time Magazine's special issue on Earth, global warming is a very serious issue. Even the chief executive of British Petroleum, which stands to lose economically if we take steps to curb global warming, has said it would be unwise and potentially dangerous to ignore this issue. Scientists predict that while maximum temperatures will rise, minimum temperatures will rise more dramatically. Warming will also be greater in the lower atmosphere than the upper atmosphere, which may contribute to unstable weather patterns. Moisture in the air has increased by 10% in the last 20 years, which has also increased the frequency and severity of some storms. Since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in the middle of the 18th century, levels of carbon, carbon dioxide have jumped 30%, nitrous oxide 15%, and methane gas 100%. Without a change in our current rate of industrial growth, greenhouse gas concentrations are expected to triple in the next 100 years and exceed any levels present on the planet for the last 50 million years. And so we do acknowledge, I guess, that there have been levels like that in the past, but not recently. Now we're going to do phones in the rest of the show, and you can certainly go after our guests. They will disagree, you'll find, over a number of these issues. And if you think that all of this is, is bunk, then we want to hear from you too. We'll take a quick break. We'll be back with your calls. <laughs> Tayam Shi is brought to you in part by Metro Lexus Toyota, leaders in customer satisfaction. It bothers me when people pay more than they should for thin and light lenses. At LensCrafters, we have these featherweights lenses. They're thin and light, they're less expensive, and they're really tough. Now watch this. It can even stand up to a direct hit like this. Take a look at that. No lens is shatterproof. Wow. These are 10 times more shatter resistant than other thin lenses. Only LensCrafters has featherweights, and we can make them in about an hour. Giving our customers a, a thin, light lens at a better price makes me feel good about what I do. Lens Crafters, helping people see better one hour at a time. Tefal, the number one brand of non-stick cookware is about to change cooking with this exclusive anti-warping stainless steel disc. This is Armorel. Inside, Armorel's new granite texture is even more scratch resistant. 
The result, a non-stick pan designed to last even longer, both on the inside and on the outside. Armoral from Tefal, available at Canadian Tire, major department stores and most other fine houseware retailers in Canada. I want to keep my smile for life, don't you? But everybody has plaque, the leading cause of gum disease. Three out of four people will have some form of gum disease in their lifetime. You can do something about it. Interplaque by Conair is clinically proven to remove nearly all plaque, even below the gum line. Its unique cleaning action can actually reverse gum disease. And Interplaque is a leading ADA-accepted power toothbrush. Interplaque by Conair. Recommended by dentists to keep you smiling for life. Quality stands the test of time. Now blend new country furniture with fine antiques from Cobble Hill Country Furnishings. Select from unique pieces. Complement your purchase with country furniture made to stand the test of time. Fine antiques and fine country furniture are on display at our show home or visit our store. Cobble Hill Country Furnishings, timeless furniture for your home, inside and Cobble out. Cobble Hill Country Furnishings, tomorrow's news today. Today we're talking about global warming. Our guests are Bruce Torrey, he's an environmentalist, and Andrew Weaver is a professor at UVic. He's a climatologist at Earth and Ocean Sciences. And what you're looking at is the current edition of Canadian Geographic and what Canada's climate hotspot is telling us about global warming. And I was quite surprised. This is something that actually has been looked at in some detail. And you may want to read it because actually the Mackenzie Basin is a good chunk of British Columbia, basically Prince George sort of north, and a lot uh, northern prairies and uh, Yukon and a little bit of Alaska. So go to the phones, and there's a lot of people. Now, in the lower mainland, what we want to hear from you is, would you be prepared to get out of your cars if you think that greenhouse gas emissions are contributing to global warming? So let's hear from you. And let's talk to Jean in Victoria. Hi, Jean. Hi. Hi, go ahead. I enjoy your program. Well, thank you. Um, I think the global warming, a lot of it is the addition to the population. There's far too many people on the planet, right. and it's still growing by leaps and bounds. Nobody's keeping it under control. Right. These people, in the primitive countries, they use wood to cook their meals, and in other countries they use electricity, which some of it is uh, produced by fossil fuels. We seem to be flooding areas to make more dams to produce power, right. and that means chopping down trees, right. and we're not replacing our trees. We used to have beautiful forests in Southern California, and it's gradually becoming a desert, which is progressing north. Right. And uh, I think if we had less people, I think China has a good idea. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, well, thank you for that, uh, for that input. Population. I mean, it's been a long time since we've heard people talking about population control or the population bomb over six billion people on the planet. Uh, how much does that have to do with the problems? It's your turn. <laughs> what is important is that the rich countries, the Western companies, countries that tend to have stable populations, are responsible for most of the emissions and also most of the, the toxins that are released into the environment. The developing countries, whilst Gene is perfectly correct about deforestation and gathering firewood, that's a huge issue in those countries, but they tend to use between one-tenth and one-hundredth as much of the actual emissions as we are responsible for here. So we are the ones putting out most of it, and we are the ones that can do the most in reductions, and we're not doing that. That's the great tragedy at uh, Kyoto. Okay. Well, let's uh, go back to the call so you can do the next one. Let's talk to Dave now in Port Alberni, where, Dave, you might be uh, have a comment on the forest sector. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, being a laid-off logger and uh, from Clockwood Sound and right. different uh, Port Alberni here now, Right. What, what is the difference with a young forest and an old forest? Does not a young forest grow faster and produce more oxygen than an old, decadent, half-dead forest? And, uh, you know... The, like you're talking about fires and that too, and uh, right. fires in, in Canada are are like a hundred times more in size than whatever is logged by by a man. And um, you know, there's other things like Mount St. Helens and Krakatoa and shit like that. When they went, when they blew or stuff like that, when they blew up, <laughs> <laughs> that that pr created more pollution than yeah. than uh, any any uh, you know cars or anything that's going to happen. And 
China's coming online with a billion new cars, and right. how can a little country like Canada, if, they, if we stop logging and shut down our few million cars, and mm -hmm. what, what, you know? What impact will that have? Where's, the, where's it all going to come? Are we all going to be out of a job and all sitting around waiting for some scientist to tell us we can work again? <laughs> okay, well, thank you for that, Dave. I think he's put a very practical oh, yeah. uh, a spin to this. And also in, in BC, uh, you know, we have a lot of parks that have been created in the last five years. So some people would say that we're, with the Forest Practices Code and the parks and everything, that we're probably not not to, to be as concerned as some other parts of Canada. I tend concerned. to agree with him actually that the uh, the question of cutting down old I mean there's whole other issues about old growth forests the biodiversity and the loss of natural habitat and, and erosion but sometimes people like to put that into the global warming debate and I personally don't think you should the reason being is that it depends what you do with the forest if you cut down an, an old growth forest and you make Queen Anne furniture and you stick it in your house for a hundred years that is actually sequestering carbon provided you plant trees back where you where they were sequestering work. carbon that means taking carbon and putting it and storing it it's a form oh, of storage okay. if you plant new trees you will in fact uh, take more carbon out so that's oh. true the problem arises when you cut down a forest and you put it, make it a parking lot that is when you no longer have a, uh, a, a, a carbon sink through the forest okay now I know that we're gonna have a lot of people who want to debate about forest and we do want to hear about that too we still want to hear from you in the Vancouver area about whether or not you'd get out of your cars to help the global warming uh, issue if you think that's part of the problem. We'll take more of your calls. We'll be back after a quick break, and we're talking about global warming. Eaton's has great holiday deals every week. Want to take a peek? A 25-inch Daiwu stereo TV is $40 off, you see. And only at Eaton's, strike up the band. There's a 27-inch Panasonic TV and stand. Put this sharp view cam under your tree, and a forehead VCR is yours for free. Plus, this will make you feel fine. You don't pay till $19.99. And there's me, Mr. Magical Moose. <laughs> only $9.93. I'm never at home. Why would I leave my phone there? What do you get with Amigo Digital? Every month you get 100 anytime minutes and 100 first incoming minutes free. Yeah, I'm free. Free. You get call display. Staying in touch doesn't mean staying in. And oh yeah, there's no long-term contract. I call shots. And you get it all for just $19.95 a month. Amigo Digital. It goes with you. If the liver wasn't available for me, I would have died within 24 hours. An organ donor registry has been introduced in BC that replaces all previous ways to indicate your wishes for organ donation. Think of making the decision to give somebody else life. It's an amazing gift. Amazing. To sign up, you must fill in a registration card and return it to the BC Transplant Society. That person saved my life. Thank you. Now you don't have to clean your dishes twice. Introducing new Electrosol Automatic Dishwasher Tabs. It's a perfectly measured two-layered tablet that dissolves completely. The blue layer breaks up stuck-on foods. The white layer gently scrubs your dishes till they shine, giving you dishes that look like this the first time. New Electrosol Tabs, the next dimension of clean. Our question of the day, do you think we're experiencing climate change? And do you think government is doing enough about that? And here are some of your comments. Ooh, I think so. <coughs> Bless you. <laughs> I do, personally. Yeah, because it's, I don't know, one day it's just all warm. Like, for instance, this morning, it was um, just exactly like this. And then 10 minutes later, it was freezing and raining. And, it's, and then now it's back like this again. So, yeah, I definitely think so. Do you think the government is doing enough to address this? No. Why? I don't know. They just basically just, they don't do anything about anything. They just basically just sit there and do their own little thing. They don't really listen to the public too much. You seem to be, yes. Yeah. Why is that? Well, I don't know. It seems to be milder in the fall and winter than it used to be. Do you think the government is doing enough to address this? Uh, does the government ever do enough to address anything? They say so. Well, I don't know. There's conflicting opinions on it. You know, some of the scientists say, yeah, the greenhouse effect is taking hold, and others say, no, it's uh, long term. I don't know. Who do you believe? Do you think the government's doing enough to address it? 
I think at the moment they're probably doing all they can. You know, I mean, there's a lot of different interests at stake there, so uh, I have to see what happens. It's always nice to hear from the public. They're very, very smart. You should see in the second package another set of very intelligent questions. So anyway, we'll start with Ron in Sydney. Hi, Ron. Uh, I'm uh, very interested in hearing what Mr. Torrey says about uh, uh, the uh, destruction of our forests and our trees. Mm -hmm. I think we have to uh, certainly reduce the emission from fossil, fossil fuels, but I think we should back it up by having something that will take over. Otherwise, we'll lose our industry, and uh, uh, I think our country might be in a difficult position if we have to shut all our yeah. industries down. Yeah. But I think with this coming century, the 2000th century, the government or some group might sponsor a plan whereby each child in school is given a tree uh, even uh, in, in a little pot or so, in some way or other, to go home and plant right. and be told why he's doing it. Now, it doesn't have to be an evergreen. It can be deciduous trees are beautiful. Mm -hmm. But if we did that and we repeat that each year, right. that is how the Peace Arch was built at uh, uh, the border between here and, the, and Washington that we go by. Uh, my name is in there. It went in many, many years ago. Okay. But uh, the names of all the children that gave 10 cents toward building that as a monument to peace, uh, it was a very successful project. I think a mm -hmm. similar That's pattern could be uh, employed. We've got a bare prairie. Right. I think if every, every farmer uh, planted, say, 10 trees along the border of one of his fields each year, they could spy the trees. Mm -hmm. He could keep an eye on them, mm -hmm. and uh, we, 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 the prairies could be restored to a great extent. Otherwise, we're going to lose everything to silt right. at the same time as, hard, as uh, uh, hurting the environment. Okay, well, thank, thank you. I, you very much. I, I uh, appreciate your effort in this direction okay. because uh, we don't want the Earth in a few years' time to look like... Uh, the moon or Mars or something <laughs> like that, which certainly will happen. Yeah, okay, well, thank you very much, Ron. Now, a lot of very thoughtful comments there. And Go ahead, Bruce. The caller makes some excellent points, and when we talk it's about... It's because he agreed with you. Well, <laughs> no, he talked about trees and their role in preserving the yeah. world the way we like it. Right. And the way the public can become involved, and I'd like to come back to that, but one thing people don't understand when we talk about emissions that should be linked and isn't, is that those emissions, not just are CO2, they are also acidic. And when you have all of this acidic, especially coming from burning dirty coal, for example, Alberta is the, the biggest acid emitter in the country from burning all of the coal to generate electricity to sell below the border. All of that acid deposits itself in our, on the environment, on the fields and on the slopes. And as the environment becomes more and more acidified, it becomes impossible to grow trees. Right. For example, if the pH of a forest is 5, there's a healthy earthworm population. If it's 4.5, there's 50% of the earthworm population. And if the pH is 4, there are no earthworms. Okay, so, so you're saying a tiny little adjustments can have a huge impact. Right, and the I steps have to go we back take to. to, the to be, now. Okay. <laughs> and he had a lot of good points, and otherwise we won't get anyone else's comments on. Let's turn next to Andrew. Let's talk to Dave in New Westminster. Hi, Dave. Hi. Hi, go ahead. Um, I'm just uh, dumbfounded by some of the comments. You have like a nine year old woman talking about population explosion. You have uh, some obvious logger talking about little trees that are better than big trees. Mm -hmm. And what, you know what it comes down to is, is if you're dirty, mm -hmm. you're going to pay for it. You know, we are dirty. We are not clean. We don't take, uh, you know, you'll, you'll drive a block and a half to the corner store, warm up the car for a half an hour to get there. Right. It's ridiculous. You know, it's, if, if, if we, it's just common sense. If we look at it realistically, yes, we are causing an effect to our uh, environment because okay. we are dirty. We're okay. not clean. Okay, well, thank you for that. I'm going to let you answer this, Andrew. Uh, we've had questions about the economy, and if we did something right now, everything would shut down, and then this fellow saying, but, you know, we'll ultimately pay for it. What do you say to people who, who confront you with those things? Well, I actually, the, the woman who phoned in about population, she nailed it on the head. The biggest single problem with, with climate, climate change is population growth. Uh, and, and why is because, sure, we're creating all the problem now, uh, but you, and we cannot impose a solution on the developing world because we have a you know <clears throat> high economic standard living here. 
yet we are now using cleaner fuel. We can't say to China, for example, you can't burn coal because you can't, you're not allowed to be at our level of economic wealth. <coughs> and, and as <coughs> so, we, it, what the problem here is is that these places are all growing in population. As they grow in population, they want to expand and their economies and and. So, the, so in my opinion, the, the big thing that one has to get at is population growth. And before you can do that, you have to get at the world's major religions, most of which do not allow any form of birth control. Interesting. Uh, interesting and provocative. Okay, let's talk to Dave now in Vancouver. Hi, Dave in Vancouver. Hi, Judy. How are you doing? Fine, thanks. Go ahead. Um, I want to talk about governments not doing enough for the environment. Um, okay. They could be developing, I don't know if anybody remembers the old warehouses, how they used to use a vacuum tube system to transfer goods around. They could probably design larger ones all through major metropolises okay. and develop giant vacuum tubes and say, just looking at electrical as an alternative form of energy and maybe have people, you know, transfer goods through oh. that sort of alternative. Because uh, okay. I'm disabled, I'm not going to give up my car. There's no way. Okay. You know, so that's okay. it. Thank Thanks. you very much for that. Bye. Um, I think he's raised an important point, and he says, I'm disabled, so I can't give up my car. Right now, we have a whole infrastructure built around the car. So individual choice really isn't going to be a solution. It'll have to be a whole infrastructure change. And people need to know that they can really help with this situation by instead of getting into their car, getting onto the bus or carpooling with a neighbor. But some people don't have that option. Like he said, I mean, being disabled, he's not going to have the same options that you or I might have. Well, that's true. But I think you've already done some talking about how the car industry helped shut down the mass transit uh, topic. That was one of the things we talked about on our first show. And we have a bus system in Victoria that, that meets some of the needs of our population, but is not the sort of thing that you could totally rely on if you're working and have odd hours. So we need to really work on building that mass transit system and not having smelly diesel buses, but having Ballard buses and, and other non-emitting vehicles as part of it. Okay. And we have uh, for you, just before the break, how you can get more information on this or how you'd like, if you want to contact our guests, you can write to Andrew Weaver at the School of Earth and Ocean Sciences University of Victoria, P.O. Box 3055, Victoria, B.C., V8W, 3P6. Email is weaver at ocean.cor.uvic.ca. Or you can contact Bruce Torrey at the Skies Above Foundation, 903 Don Lane, Victoria, B.C., V9B5A6, phone 250-391-9223, fax 250-391-9280, and email is skies at islandnet.com. And there's also an internet site which with all kinds of information on skies above. And we'll take more of your calls. We're talking about global warming, and we'll be right back. People helping people make it a better day. your community. Please give generously to this year's United Way campaign. What do you love to watch on TV? For me, it's a nice family show. Everyone has their favorites. Home decorating is cool. Now Rogers gives you more with 16 new channels. One great new package. More of what you want when you want it. Call it selfish. Call it instant gratification. It's science fiction for me. Call it Me TV. Order now and you can get Me TV for as little as $5.99 a month. Call one triple eight Rogers one to order. I don't know. This seems very unorthodox. Look, he's looking forward to a good breakfast. how to develop a sound business plan required for success in today's business. I now own a specialty floral shop called the Rose Store and More, located at 2nd and Burrard.
And there's some interesting stuff. We uh, don't have enough time to tell you all these things, but we will show you a few more opinions from the street. And here's our question of the day. Do you think we are experiencing climate change? And do you think government is doing enough about that? And here are some more wise comments from people we met. Well, I think for sure that we are. Why is that? Well, it's just uh, warmer and uh, a lot more rain than usual. It's just uh, a lot different than it used to be. Tide. Do you think uh, the government's doing enough to address this? Well, I think they could do more to find out what it, what's causing it all. I think we probably are, but global climate changes have been taking place for generations, eons. So you don't think there's a, there's a big change right now? No, we've gone from desert to ice age to <laughs> back again. This is part of a cycle. Well, I suppose it could be. I mean, there's so many things that are happening. What happens when you start knocking all the trees down in the Amazon? You've got no control over the, uh, uh, the excess amount of precipitation. It's got to go somewhere. Do you think the government? Do you think the government's doing enough to address it? Well, how can one person do all the damage and the rest sit back and watch? Does that answer your question? Uh, if they don't do something pretty quick. We're not going to have too much of anything left. Do you think the government's doing enough to address it? I think they're in denial, and it costs too much, and they're more worried about economics than our global health. I think. And uh, I think people don't take enough time to step back and take a look and think about what they're doing. You see, it's amazing. You can find all kinds of comments, and, and from the callers, too. And we'll hear from Robert now in Victoria. Hi, Robert. Hi, Judy. How are you today? Fine, thanks. Go ahead. Great show. Oh, thanks. The last caller, or two callers ago, had a good uh, thing about waste. But my question is, what about sunspots or uh, solar flares? Does okay. that have an effect? Okay, well, I think that's a really good question. And I'm going to ask you both, maybe. I don't know if you, if you look at this. Andrew's but I know one Bruce of my has... favorite experts, so let's have <laughs> it. Uh, sunspots are not one of my favorite topics. The problem, problem with sunspots is, is as follows. The signal is so... They, they happen every 11, 22 years. There's different cycles in them. The signal is incredibly weak. You know, one, one hundredth of a percent of the solar intensity. It's so weak. So the only evidence for sunspots having any effect is through the fact that people correlate sunspot cycles with time series in, of climate variables. But they cannot... And have they found that there's, oh, there's correlation? but they cannot provide any, any physical reason as to, the, to as explain to why. why. There's a relationship. So until that has happened, you can, simply cannot... So a sunspot corresponds to oh, warmings? Well, when you have a sunspot, you have a reduction, so you have a slight... Um, cooling or the people talk about icebergs off Newfoundland and correlate that with sunspots okay. but they can't the signal has to be magnified and so nobody still a big knows. question mark it's I think it's a question mark that is in the camp of those who believe in sunspots to prove it because okay. there's no theory for it right now okay let's talk to Stephen now in Vancouver hi Stephen hello hi yeah oh, it's your turn hi Judy hi. Um, it was a comment concerning uh, about the cars you mentioned would you right. give up your car right I would not. Okay. I'm an immigrant from California. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. That's a, you know. Anyway, and go ahead. I'm, it's just that in California, believe it or not, the air is getting better, yeah. and the government, the state of the California state, uh, have beginning to bring electric cars into the realm of things. Right. And when I left last year. They were selling them off, right? You know, and I think that would be a, a route to go. You're not going to force people into taking a transit system that doesn't seem to work here. Okay, well, I think that's a, a very honest answer. But we could get our politicians to supply a transit system that would work, and that would allow development of neighborhood. You could talk to your neighbors as you rode into work with them in the morning. It has all sorts of positive spin-offs, and in Europe. They have transit systems. They don't generally have very many cars in city centers. And city centers like Rome, where they do have cars, tend yeah. to be too polluted to visit. Well, right now, I think our provincial government's in a little bit of chaos. We're going to talk about that on Wednesday. But they have a few other things on their mind than transit. So we'll uh, talk about recalling that on Wednesday. <laughs> exactly. but, um, Jim in New Westminster, it's your turn. Yeah, hello, Dave. Hi. Yeah, Judy. Uh, anyways, uh, the one gentleman was mentioning his... his uh, preference for, I'll call it that, it's a bad statement, but it'll have to do, uh, the overpopulation. Right. Well, everybody's ranting, and if you, if you analyze it and watch a lot of these shows, uh, educational shows, uh, you'll find that we are something like, we have about two, well, let's put it this way, there's about two-thirds of our population that we don't need 
to bring us back to balance, the same as any other as the other species are. You think we have four billion extra people <laughs> that we don't that, that we're overpopulated by, yes, right. and it's, it'd be so easy to do it. You know, <laughs> all you'd have to do is advocate, allow abortions, take all the speed limits off. <laughs> the idiots will take care of themselves. A couple of good get nuclear of, bombs. Get too. rid of artificial insemination of both semen. Yeah. Uh, conceptions. Okay. You so know, you're, uh, you're saying you're saying let's let's go to the extremes and. Well, we, we've got it. We're at the other extreme now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, well, thank you for that. I mean, obviously, he's you know he's he's trying to say we're two thirds overpopulated. Well, Pretty we can link that to global warming because ninety percent of the world's food production is produced within five meters of sea level, mostly on the rich deltas, which are just about at sea level. So if we have a one meter sea level rise or possibly more caused by Antarctica sliding in, we would lose a substantial amount of the world's agricultural land very quickly. So and it would do you agree with that, Andrew? Antarctica sliding in? No. Oh, you don't think the water Absolutely levels not. will rise? Oh, the water levels rising, yeah. The, the projections you do agree that there will be a Oh, yeah, but that, that's oh, not because of Antarctic ice shelf sliding in. That, oh. I, that is okay. a, a little microclimate I, around Antarctica. But in I, terms I'm of sea level rise... I'm less concerned about why. <laughs> okay, no, fifth, what the best guess United Nations projection is, 50 centimeters by the year 2100. Wow. Which and is so far, every single projection I've seen has been too conservative. Like 10 years later, they revise it and say, we were way off and it's way worse than we thought. That's so important yeah. what you just said. Okay, well, we'll, we'll talk about this some more. We have Rhett from Victoria, is that right? Yep, that's right. Yeah, go ahead, please. Um, I want to know what your panelists think about uh, the need that everyone in society has to change their ways 180 degrees or else we're doomed. I've heard a number of opinions from different sources that say yeah. that's what we're going to have to do. Okay, well, thank you for that question. Um, you know, humans are not known for changing easily. Well, it's, that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So we're overpopulated. We don't have enough food now. We have people dying because they don't have the basics now. And we're not going to be able to the, do very the, much the now. It has to be, the way this gets done is people start supporting products, for example, that are environmentally friendly. And, you, and people will have to realize, for example, you have an old fridge, an old fridge that's consuming way more energy than, than a new fridge. Like we, on my fridge at home, my, my electrical bill got cut a significant amount that'll pay off the fridge in maybe five, six years because of, they had an old faulty fridge that was leaking. So if we all take these little steps, we'll make mm -hmm. it a little better. Okay. We, I yeah. always say all we have to do is go backwards because our grandparents produced their own food, kept their own food, usually had several years worth of food You're going to talk hand. about your potato lawn, aren't you? Had their I own gardens, <laughs> lawns. We sh this is a city of gardens. It should also be a city of vegetable gardens, and Victoria yeah. should be self-sufficient for its food production, I, and we could do that. I think that would be very interesting, but we're over time for a break, so we'll take a quick break. We'll be back with more of your calls. Been watching the free preview of the new cable package? Maybe tasted a little adventure with Outdoor Life Network. Shared some family time with Family Channel. Scrub, scrub. And had a break from reality with Teletoon, the animation station. Just three of the many channels in the new cable package. The free preview ends soon. To order, call one 591 1997 You could win great prizes, so turn on, tune in, and enjoy. You could be a millionaire. Well, this is what it's all about. The Vancouver General's Millionaire Lottery for $1 million, all at once, to one winner. The largest hospital lottery prize in British Columbia. And there's more, nearly $3 million to thousands of winners. For $100, a 1 in 20 chance to win. You could be a millionaire. It's here waiting for you. Call today. We're at Dave Wheaton, Pontiac Buick, talking to more real people. Which people know about used vehicles at Dave Wheaton? We have a 60-point inspection on all used vehicles. We have a 30-day uh, powertrain, and we have 15% off parts and labor. <laughs> I, I wouldn't go that far to say I sold more cars than anybody else, but uh, through the years, uh, after being here for 14 years and being in the car business for 25 years, uh, you do get to meet a lot of people. Dave Wheaton, Pontiac Buick. Real people, real close by. Come see for yourself. Back in 1886, Frederick June and his brother Arthur started one of the first tenting and outdoor stores on Vancouver Island. 
Since then, we've learned a lot about keeping our customers safe, warm, and comfortable in the great outdoors with quality outdoor apparel, hiking boots, sleeping bags, tents, and a wide range of great year-round camping gear. Because after all, great outdoor clothing isn't just for the great outdoors. Shop at June Brothers for Boxing Day prices all through December. And coming up, authors, Children's and Frogs, and on Friday, Jill Doucette. No, there is not a very bad pun intended there. That was a very unfortunate placement. Jill Doucette, it would be, be a very interesting show. That'll be our last Constitution Series show. Okay. We'll try to get as many calls in as possible. And Dolores in Surrey, you're first. Hi, Dolores. Hi. Hi, go ahead. Uh, there's a couple of things. The elderly man that spoke, right. uh, he's got a short memory. Okay. <laughs> we had a... A warming season when I was growing up, we first had um, quite a bit of um, coldness, and I remember seven below going to school. Okay. Uh, then just about it warmed up, and we had very wet winters and we, and summers. Right. We were. I was on a summer resort and grew up on one. So you're saying and when you were young, there were seasonal changes. Yeah, then. and I'm seventy now. Odd. Right. Right. Uh, if we're, uh, I watch the freeway here, and the traffic is terrific. Right. I know that is polluting, and I know we have to phrase it out slowly. Right. We can't throw things just at people and say, this is what we're going to do. Right. You've got to sl do it slowly, or you have everybody up in arms. Okay, and I think that's, that's probably very true, actually, is that if you don't phase it in over time, people will be revolting against it. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of people think it would be convenient if things move, move slowly and incrementally, but a lot of the senior scientists looking at climate are suggesting it may swing abruptly from a, a warm state to a cold state, and that global warming rain. and the melt of the Arctic ice pack and big rain events in the North Atlantic could stop the world's ma main ocean current system, the transoceanic conveyor. This is work by Wally Broker at Columbia. And if that were to happen, we'd have a dramatic, almost an ice age event happen over a couple or three or four years. Sometimes and that it, when underway. I hear you guys talk about these things, it feels like we're too far along the road. I got to jump in on that one. <laughs> because that's... Uh, All right, but hurry up. I'll we have be to go very back quick, to quick just because the problem there is, is that it's the, the idea is a f it's feedback so it's, that my colleague's referring to. Mm. The idea is that with melting uh, ice and, and rain, you would slow down what's called the conveyor in the Atlantic, which brings heat northward. This doesn't cause an ice age. What it, what it would cause is local cooling in global warming. So you would expect the region around Europe not to be as warm as other regions around the globe. Okay. I'm very confused. Right and now yeah. Deirdre from Fanny Bay. Hi, Deirdre. Hi. Hi. I just got one thing to say, um, pretty much, you know, to heck with this, uh, trying to please everybody in the racism and we can't impose on other governments and countries and whatnot. Do we want a world or not? That's what it comes down to. Okay, well, thank you for that. And I think there are a lot of people who feel that way. Who would take the lead on that uh, in terms of our current leadership? I'll let you guys answer this. Let me just take one more call quickly. And let's talk to Justin in Victoria. Hi, Justin. Hi. Um, Hi. I'm calling about the unrenewable resources. Okay. Now, 20 to 50 years from now, the unrenewable resources, such as coal and fossil fuels, right. aren't going to be around anymore. Right. So doesn't it make sense to train these workers in ulterior programs to help our economy and our environment before they're both gone? Well, that's an, an excellent point. So non-renewable resources. Not, it, he said 20 years? No. This, it's not going to be that but soon. But it's close. There's three types. There's natural gas, oil, and coal. Mm -hmm. Coal is we basically have infinite reserves on the planet. Natural gas is finite, and oil is finite, too. Now, if you look, the, 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 the coal industry will never, ever back global warming. Why? It's because they have infinite reserves, and, they, and it's dirty fuel. Right. But oil and gas are beginning to come on side, and you see a split in, in, that, in that group. And so it's... So he's right. I think he's right. If we start to diversify now and plan for it, I mean, yes, we could have a 20-year plan and have a transition. That makes sense. Well, Next I, one. I was at the climate summit in Berlin for yeah. three weeks, and I saw incredible developments in Europe. This is a couple of years ago. Yeah. They were doing all sorts of wonderful things, reducing their use of fuels, being more efficient, which reduces the cost of the products, which means you have more jobs, and you'll be able to successfully export your products because they cost less. Innovation in, and stuff, too. Here in Canada, we're embracing these old, dirty technologies, and we're being left behind by the rest of the world. And the outcome of Kyoto will be that North American products are no longer competitive 
because they haven't been produced in a very efficient manner, so mm. they'll be too expensive to sell. Interesting economic environmental argument. Um, we are going to now talk to Sam in Gibson. Hi, Sam. How are you doing? Hi. Uh, j just a quick comment. You know, we've had plenty of dialogue and warnings about the consequences of uh, polluting our environment for a long time, and it just seems that people are caught in a system that they can't even change even if they want to. And uh, as for all intents and purposes, scientists and governments as well are fiddling while Rome is burning. I mean, we don't even know at what point uh, that this situation becomes irreversible. It may be right now as we speak. Right. And for your guest, Mr. Weaver, to sit there and say, well, religions and populations are, are, are uh, a large part of the problem is ludicrous. I mean, it, the problem is this. People aren't the ones that are emit emitting the gases that are tearing apart the ozone layer. The things that they make and the things that they do are. That's Precisely. the problem is. Okay, and the and more I'm people, that. Okay. the more people, the more use. It's as simple as that. I think what he's saying is that if you go to buy something, you have a hard time controlling what's produced. I mean, you may have a long-term You have a choice of what you buy. And generally, human nature is to want to have a higher standard of living. And so everybody wants to, you know, buy things that their neighbor has. Okay, give us something happy to think of. Bruce. In North America, <laughs> you cannot even buy a fridge that doesn't contribute dramatically to global warming happy. and ozone depletion. We have like 15 seconds. We need to move our governments, and we need to move ourselves, because we can make these decisions in large measure. So people should plant trees. The caller was right on. And the Skies Above Foundation, we'd be happy to hear from you. We've got a project where we'll be planting sequoias and other trees at schools and elsewhere in Victoria. We'd love to have some help from the local folks. I'll be talking to the Hort Society about it tonight. Oh, he used up all 15 seconds. Uh, two words. Don't worry. It's not doom and gloom. <laughs> That's my closing <laughs> oh, there you words. go. Okay. And here's how you can contact us. Of course, it's uh, still a postal strike, but uh, you can save the letters. Tyabji 780 Kings Road, Victoria, B.C., V8T, 5A2. Fax is at 250-389-1226. Email is tayabji at wic.ca and our internet website, www.checktv.com with all kinds of information on it. And we'll be back after a quick break. Switch that dial, because this is going to make you smile. For the holidays, Eaton's is taking $50 off the new Hoover Wind Tunnel Vacuum and the Hoover Steam Vac. And there's me, Mr. Magical Moose. <laughs> Only $9.93. Oh. Look! Hello! Welcome! Welcome! Ah. Well, next time, think yellow first. America, millions of you have skinny hair. Well, stop hiding it. From Conair, get the Big Curls Hot Air Curling Iron and Brush. Styles as it dries, brushes in volume. Nobody's bigger in hair than Conair. Euro Salon Dryer by Conair combines the best of sleek European styling and advanced engineering. With 1600 watts, three heat settings, two speeds, and a cool shot button, this hair dryer gives you the power to style quickly with great versatility and control. Back in 1886, Frederick June and his brother Arthur started one of the first tenting and outdoor stores on Vancouver Island. Since then, we've learned a lot about keeping our customers safe, warm, and comfortable in the great outdoors with quality outdoor apparel, hiking boots, sleeping bags, tents, and a wide range of great year-round camping gear. Because after all, great outdoor clothing isn't just for the great outdoors. Shop at June Brothers for Boxing Day prices all through December. Eaton's has great holiday deals every week. Want to take a peek? For the holidays, Eaton's is shaving up to $30 off all bronze shavers. And there's me, Mr. Magical Moose. Only $9.93. And tomorrow we're going to be talking to a number of BC authors. Some of you will remember Cyril Shelford. He's written a book. He's featured in one of our stories. And we have four authors on set, and another one we'll show you in a story. And it'll be kind of an interesting change from some of our heavier topics, but it'll all be about the subject matter. Today we talked about global warming, and I think it's a very important issue. And You should know that in 1990 I started to get quite involved with the environmental movement in the Okanagan, and at that time was quite alarmed to see some of the things that were coming forward. Now environmentalism at that time was considered to be way off and, and kind of weird, 
And I, what I've noticed is that a lot of the arguments that were made at that time that were being disputed have actually proven to have a lot more basis in what's happened since then than those who were yelling that they were wrong. And I think that we have to err on the side of caution. When it comes to global warming, we need to, at the very least, debate on this issue and hopefully come to some solutions together. I'm Judy Tayabji. That's my opinion. What's yours? It's here where you'll feel much better about your in-laws. Check TV. It's here. Today on Canadian Living TV. Massaging your way through pregnancy. Fashions for big, bold, and beautiful women. Famous hairstylists share their secrets. Easy ways to dress up your shelves and low-fat chocolate fudge cake.